welcome uh, to all of you who are here with us uh, physically and uh, welcome to our uh, online audience. My name is Christine Haight Farley and I'm a professor here and I co-direct along with my colleague in the audience, Michael Carroll, our program on information justice and intellectual property law. And uh, you are in the right place um, because there was an uh, argument this morning at the Supreme Court um, involving an IP matter. And whenever that occurs, then we meet at five o'clock the same day and we discuss the case. Um, and we always invite um, the parties um, who argued the case to come and join us. And I am so crazy delighted today that we have um, the lawyers for both of the parties here. Um, and we invite uh, select um, amicus brief authors, um, and we have two very distinguished uh, amicus brief authors, one who is going to make a dramatic entrance um, uh, with a view towards hopefully getting a diversity of viewpoints um, on the topic um, so that we can um, kind of probe where the differences lie and, and whether there's any uh, room for agreement on, on, any, on any topics. Um, so uh, there is also a trademark case tomorrow morning, um, and I hope that you might check in with us again tomorrow night at five, um, either in person or again online. Um, we have a stellar lineup for that one as well. Um, but we are here um, for this uh, case today um, that, that is about extraterritorial reach. Um, and I'm just checking my notes to see if there's anything else. Okay. So let me very, very briefly, in the interest of time, so we have more time to discuss the case, um, introduce the panel to you. Um, there is a handout at the check-in desk with full biographies that, that I commend to you because we really do have wonderful speakers today. Um, so um, we'll begin at the end of the table with Lucas Walker, um, who is at Molo Lamkin. Uh, law firm, and he was the counsel uh, for petitioners um, at uh, Abitron. Um, next, we have Matthew Hellman, uh, who is at Jenner and Block, and he was counsel for respondent, who is Hetronic. And so before any further introductions, let me just say congratulations to both <laughs> of you. Um, it was a really terrific argument this morning, and um, I just found you both to be very calm and assuring in your in your confidence in your positions and and your knowledge and preparation for all of the questions it it just seemed to be a very kind of relaxed and reassuring um discussion so congratulations to both of you and um i said it privately i'm just so super impressed that you still have the ability to talk about this case <laughs> so i'm glad that you did um next um i want to turn uh, to um our amicus brief authors um, we have Professor Tim Holbrook from Emory Law School, um, and he wrote an amicus brief on behalf of three law school professors in support of neither party. Um, and then um, finally, we have uh, Ted Davis, um, who will be joining us shortly, I'm, I'm hoping, um, uh, who is a partner at Kilpatrick Townsend, and he wrote an amicus brief um, for the Intellectual Property Owners Association, again, in support of neither party. Um, so, I'm, as I said, I'm delighted that we have the lawyers for both parties here, and I'm also delighted that we have such a balanced um, uh, a panel of speakers. We don't always get that. I don't think we're going to get it quite to the same extent tomorrow. Um, so I, I think it'll be a, a really lively um, and thorough discussion. So I thought I would offer um, just a little background on the case so that we can go deep into the case and you'll understand um, all of all of the um, viewpoints that are going to be expressed. Um, so the parties um, are two companies, uh, one in the United States and one in Germany, um, or or companies in Germany that were at one time one company. It's it's too complicated for me to get into, but there what there there is some relationship between the companies um, that were at some point split, which created some issues around intellectual property. Um, so both companies make um, remote control, um, uh, uh, radio remote control devices for construction, um, uh, not the kind of thing that you and I would probably encounter. Uh, and um, the respondent is the US, uh, is um, uh, 
uh, Hatronic International, but is based in the United States, has U.S. trademarks, filed a uh, infringement claim in a U.S. court relying on U.S. law um, asserting these U.S. trademarks against the uh, petitioner Abitron, um, who operates in the European Union, um, making radio remote controls um, that uh, Hetronic says infringed their trademarks. Um, so this and um, the uh, jury awarded um, the plaintiff, Hetronic, respondent today, uh, $90 million in damages for their trademark claims. The Tenth Circuit agreed um, that the Lanham Act, our trademark act, did reach these claims, um, but had a different viewpoint on exactly what the test should be for these cases. Um, so this case raises the question of extraterritorial reach. Um, and uh, I just wanna give you a little bit of a timeline. Our current trademark act, which is called the Lanham Act or referred to as the Lanham Act was uh, enacted in 1946. A few years later, in 1952, the Supreme Court did hear a case of trademark infringement in which there was an issue of extraterritorial reach, and that case is called Steel v. Bulova Watch. Um, this, this case was much discussed uh, in the oral argument today. Um, in that case, again, there was a U.S. trademark owner who brought suit in a U.S. court asserting infringement of their U.S. trademarks under U.S. trademark law. Um, for um, uh, allegedly infringing watches made and sold in Mexico. Um, and the Supreme Court said the question is whether Congress intended to make the law applicable to the facts of that case. Um, the Supreme Court said ultimately that it did. Um, uh, the Supreme Court said that the Lanham Act has a broad jurisdictional grant um, and it held, um, and I'm going to do air quotes, um, that the defendant's operations and effects um, uh, uh, were not confined to the foreign territory. Um, and then it pointed to specific facts, which were that the defendant bought parts in the United States to make these watches, um, and that the allegedly infringing watches made their way back into the United States and there were documented cases of US consumers being confused about the uh, who made the watch, whether it was a bull of a watch, um, and that this kind of confusion had a negative impact on Bulova's um, reputation because the watches were breaking. Um, so that case is pretty much um, related to the case that we had today, um, but um, the Supreme Court in that case did not create a test and in fact, um, I was quite interested in the disagreement, the very healthy disagreement about, about what that case said um, uh, in the argument today. Um, and so as the court did not make a test, well, the circuits came in and they made their tests. Um, one very prominent um, test was made by the Second Circuit. Um, that's called the Vanity Fair Mills test. That test has three factors. One is whether there is substantial effects on US commerce. Two is um, what citizenship is the defendant? And three is comity, um, meaning would a decision in a US court conflict with trademark rights in the foreign jurisdiction? Um, other circuits had different takes on that um, and, uh, and hence the circuit split that, that got this case to the Supreme Court. Now, the presumption against extraterritorial reach of U.S. statutes is not confined to trademark law, and the Supreme Court has, has recently heard a number of cases on this topic. Um, today, the justices referred to that body of cases as the modern framework, and so the court seemed very interested in how to square their modern framework, framework with what they had earlier said in the uh, Bulova watch case or, or whether that was possible was one of their questions. So under the modern framework, um, there are two steps. The first is um, whether the presumption against extraterritorial reach has been rebutted by Congress um, with clear indication. Um, and then in step two, we look at the specific provisions being alleged. Um, if the 
if the um, presumption has been rebutted, um, then the court asks whether in whether the case is within the statutory limits, um, and it, if, it's, it, it, if it is not um, rebutted, then the court asks whether this is a domestic application given the, stat, the statute's focus, um, in quotes, focus. Um, so uh, that, is your, that is your setup. <laughs> so what, I, what I'd now like to ask um, each of the panelists is to briefly um, give us your head notes. Um, uh, can you briefly tell us um, the main points um, that you argued in your brief and in your oral argument today? And I'll start with you, Lucas. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here and thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, representing the petitioners at the front, a uh, number of foreign uh, companies, German and Austrian companies. Uh, we were the defendants in the trademark litigation here. And there were two sets of sales that were being challenged. You know, there, there was about 200,000 uh, euros of sales that were made into the United States. And even though we were selling them from abroad, we didn't dispute that that's a domestic application of the Lanham Act. U.S. law can reach those sales. Um, but 99.7% of all the sales were made abroad. They were made to foreign buyers. Uh, and so our argument was that the uh, presumption against extraterritoriality, the you know the strong presumption that U.S. law doesn't govern foreign conduct, prevented U.S. law from reaching those sales, the use of the trademarks outside of the United States. Um, and as Christine explained, the the court in the past decade, decade and a half or so, has really refined that presumption. You need a clear, affirmative, unmistakable indication in the text of a statute in order to give it effect outside of the United States. And there's nothing in the Lanham Act, certainly we don't see anything in the Lanham Act that uh, uh, that says that it applies to uses of trademarks abroad. And in fact, in the trademark context in particular, there has long been for about a century um, an understanding that trademark protections are territorial. There's a number of treaties signed by nearly 200 countries that are based on the idea that each country's trademark protections apply within its borders. And that's the way that everyone gets along. Um, and so, uh, our view was given that both the general presumption and the trademark specific rules of territoriality, that the Lanham Act should not apply extraterritorially. And um, in response to that, you'll hear a little bit more from Matt, I'm sure. It, I think they basically have uh, two responses. One is, well, actually it defines commerce really broadly. So it has to be the use of a trademark in commerce. Commerce is defined as everything that Congress can lawfully regulate. Uh, and our response there is that under the court's extraterritoriality cases, that kind of commerce language, definitions of commerce, even if they refer expressly to foreign commerce sometimes, is not enough to apply US law abroad, because that's a pretty big deal for Congress to do that. So we want something clearer before the court is going to go um, that far. In fact, in, for other statutes, there are some statutes where uh, Congress has said, yes, this language, this commerce language goes to the full extent of the constitutional commerce power and they said, but no, no, it doesn't make it it doesn't make it extraterritorial. So our view is that that is not enough to overcome the presumption. Uh, and then uh, steel itself was well before the court refined all of this uh, extraterritoriality doctrine, um, and it, its analysis really doesn't fit with what the court is doing today. Mm -hmm. And so our view on that is, I mean, the court certainly could say steel is no longer good law. The we have moved past its approach to extraterritoriality. Um, but the court even doesn't need to do that in this case because Steele itself, very first sentence says, the issue is whether it applies to a U.S. citizen who's acting abroad. And so that itself distinguishes it from a case like this one that involves foreign defendants um, who are acting abroad and kind of have the greatest amount of the, the risk of international friction, the way the court puts it, international friction or discord that would come when you apply U.S. law mm -hmm. to people acting outside of the United States. I could go on, but I think it's probably <laughs> time to... Pass the, pass the torch. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, and I just want to say at the start, thank you to American University for holding this. It's, uh, it's sort of an interesting experience to do the argument and then take a few hours and then talk about it again. So hopefully we have something uh, interesting left to tell you all. Uh, so respondents' position in this case builds on a few things. There's a, a long tradition of both in the trademark context and elsewhere of foreign conduct that ha takes place overseas, but nonetheless has a substantial effect on um, American commerce. Uh, that's what you see in the antitrust laws. 
And it's also what you see in the trademark laws. The, the Lanham Act, as Lucas was saying, uh, what, whatever it means, it certainly says that it reaches all infringing uses of trademarks in commerce that Congress can regulate. And one kind of commerce that Congress can regulate is commerce between nations. And so the foreign conduct here, uh, to the extent it was foreign, essentially deprived Tetronic, a US company, of its ability to make sales uh, using its mark to other customers in Germany and around the world. Although the infringement, some of it anyway, took place overseas with uh, 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 the petitioners saying that they were us and, and holding themselves out as us, the effect of that was felt here in the United States. And so the court, you know, there's sort of showing that there's nothing new under the sun, I suppose, the court really did deal with this in the steel case that we've all been talking about. That was a case where um, it was an American citizen, but what he did was he took a lot of watch parts to Mexico and then started to sell them there, uh, uh, holding them out as Malova watches, a fancy watch. And what the court said was just because he was doing that in Mexico doesn't mean that the Lanham Act doesn't reach it. In fact, given the Lanham Act's sweeping, as it called it, uh, definition of commerce, it held that it fell within the act. So as we saw the case, the you know, uh, one thing to keep in mind is the court had already addressed the presumption against extraterritoriality and found that this act cleared it. And normally when a court, uh, when, when the Supreme Court issues a statutory ruling, it won't change it because Congress can always step in and say, no, actually, you got the Lanham Act wrong. We didn't mean to go this broadly. But we've had, as I, I said a few times uh, this morning, 70 years of experience with the Lanham Act being applied extraterritorially. Congress has never come in. So it's not a question of first principles, although we're happy to talk about it from first principles. It's a, it's a question of precedent and statutory stare decisis. And then there's a further issue in the case, which is that even if you don't treat the act as applying extraterritorially, under the court's framework, you can still, in something that doesn't actually sound all that different from the step one analysis, you can still uh, reach foreign conduct that has the necessary domestic effect if that effect is on something that's the focus of the statute. And so you heard a lot of questions today about what is the focus of the uh, Lanham Act. Uh, the United States, which was taking a position in support of neither party said, it's a focus on consumer confusion. So if Americans are confused, it doesn't really matter where the, the, the infringement takes place. That American confusion is a domestic effect that counts with the act. There's also a question, as we argued, that uh, protection of trademark holders goodwill is a concern of the act. And so if a US mark holder is uh, harmed by foreign yeah. infringement, that should count as well. And so uh, our position to the court was, you know, whether you do it as an extraterritorial application or you do it as a domestic application, either way, foreign conduct that has the requisite effect uh, on US commerce or US consumers or US mark holders is uh, within, the, within the ambit of the act. Oh, thank you. So I want to turn it over to the amicus brief authors, and I want to welcome um, Ted, who you've already been introduced. People were giving a standing ovation before you arrived. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, I guess what I'd like you to to both address is, you know, why did you why did you write a brief in this case? Um, what what motivated you on behalf of who you were representing, um, and what um, what what points did you feel needed to be added, and what you know what was your individual take on on these issues? So I've been writing about extraterritoriality before the Supreme Court has decided to reinvigorate the presumption against extraterritoriality, mostly in the patent space. Uh, and so I got into this case, I did write an article about patent, copyright, and trademark, which was cited in the cert petition, which really did get my attention. That's one way, if you want us interested, <laughs> cite us. Um, and so uh, I've been interested in the ways that the courts have, with both steel and with some others in the patent space, uh, have been approaching extraterritoriality, but ignoring the comedy, ignoring the conflict dynamic, even though in steel it's express, right? You must consider it. And in some of the older patent cases, this case, DECA versus the United States, uh, a predecessor court to the federal circuit, the patent court said, you got to think about conflicts. And that language disappears. 
from almost all the IP cases, except in the trademark space where there is this robust consideration of conflict. So that's what got me interested in this case. And then I worked with two other professors who had their own sort of interest in trademark law as well. Uh, and so for us, the big takeaway, similar to the Solicitor General, is you've got to reconcile steel with your modern two-step framework, right? And there, there are inconsistencies or tensions at best. Uh, and so we did tend to think that the presumption has not been rebutted. Uh, the statutory language is not there. If you look at the Steele case, the dissent gestures to the presumption, but the majority really is not talking in any meaningful way about the presumption. Uh, and work that Professor Bill Dodge has done, who is like the eminent extraterritorial person, uh, said they weren't applying the presumption at that time. It really just was not part of the conversation. Uh, and so given that Morrison really seems to be the court step, even though Microsoft versus I4I I sort of alludes to the presumption, Morrison is the court really saying, no, this is actually important. And we're going to take the presumption seriously. There's rhetorical flourish in there about it being a craven watchdog if it's so easily rebutted. So in my our view, this was an effort by the court to bump up the presumption. So step one, not rebutted, but to reconcile with below with Steele, it's the focus analysis that really that substantial effect dynamic is really about is there a domestic injury that is under within the, the sort of the, the focus of the statute. And we think that's where the work can be done. There's still some ambiguity, I think, about is it substantial effects or is just some showing of likelihood of confusion enough. But we think that the test should be likelihood of confusion. Domestically, we have done a locus analysis in trademark law for a really long time, right? If you're infringing in California and there's no confusion in New York, we worry about the geographical scope domestically. And so it didn't seem that much of a stretch to think about that at the international uh, level as well. Uh, second, obviously, I was arguing for the conflicts type stuff that you really need to explain to us since RJR doesn't really talk about how does comedy fit into your analysis. Sometimes they say it doesn't matter. Other times they say it's at its apex. So please explain what role does comedy play in this at all. And I think it should be explicit. And finally, which I think having a patent perspective, this is clearer to me, but for me, it's muddled in this case, uh, is the difference between a liability provision and a remedies provision. Uh, in the Western GECO case, now I'm saying in GECO instead of GECO, uh, the Supreme Court looked at a patent remedy provision and said, well, actually, because it doesn't speak to the definition of infringement, you would then look to the liability provision. But it was clear that was a distinct analysis than simply saying, we only consider the presumption at liability afterwards anything goes. And so we think that's important here because some of this is about remedies and lost sales overseas to look at that remedy provision and then tie it to the relevant uh, liability provision, assuming the remedy provision does not itself define the extraterritorial scope. Uh, and so for us, that seems to be not caught in a lot of the, the arguments so far. So we think it's important for them to really reify what they said in Western GECO, which did not come up today at the argument at all. The, the case didn't wasn't even mention, um, but to make sure you're being careful about that distinction between the two provisions, uh, which gets to the foregone sales theory. Western GECO arguably supports that, although there's some, some arguments against that as well. Uh, and of course, we also thought the citizenship stuff doesn't matter. We create weird systems if U.S. citizens can be regulated anywhere, regardless of what happens. I, and then we also had a little end. Of the, it, this did get referenced in the argument a little bit. I don't know if they'll do it. There is technically a circuit split about whether this is a subject matter jurisdiction question or whether it's the question of the merits of the case. And we did suggest to the court that the, the trend here, given their Arbaugh decision a few years ago, suggests that this is not a jurisdictional question. This is a question on the merits, and they should make that clear. Unless you're in the Civ Pro, you probably don't care. But there are reasons, like, can you waive it or not, that it becomes important. And so we just hope maybe they take the chance to, like, yeah, clarify that. I don't think they will, but we threw that in there as well. Great. Thank you. Okay, sorry to have arrived uh, late, uh, uh, achieved the the high distinction of being dropped off twice by Lyft at the wrong location uh, before making my way here. Um, I am here on, on behalf of a group called the Intellectual Property Owners Association, on behalf of whom uh, I've helped prepare a brief. My co-author and the actual heavy lifter is Susan Russell, who is uh, in, the, in the back of the room. So I want to make sure she gets the credit she deserves for our brief. Um, if you're not familiar with, with our client in this particular matter, it's a trade association. Again, the name is Intellectual Property Owners Association. 
that pretty much tells you what it is. It's a, a group uh, composed of typically very, very large intellectual property owners. Um, and it had two priorities when it started looking at, at this case, uh, one of which is that as, as largely a domestic U.S. entity, um, it, it wants to be able to, to uh, sue what it perceives, mean, its members want to be able to sue what, it, what they perceive as infringement abroad. Um, at the same time, it does not want to be hit with the same sort of monetary relief uh, in litigation in other countries, or I should say its members don't want to be hit with the same kind of monetary relief in litigation in other countries. Um, so we were working with two sort of contradictory themes in, in the brief that we put together. Um, but there, there were some things that uh, we, we had a consensus within the group and a, a consensus with the instructions we received, and one of which was um, to try and uh, convince the court that, that steel is, is a viable case, um, and it, it still is a viable rule. And obviously, as you've heard, and as I think is, is very much true, the court's affection for the presumption against extraterritoriality has grown considerably since 1952, and uh, cases, especially Morrison, you, you have a completely different approach. Um, I do think, though, that the, the court did address the general idea in Steele, um, and so therefore, I, I think it, it's difficult to, to argue that Steele, you could argue Steele is incorrectly decided. Um, I do think it's, in, it's difficult to argue that it doesn't address that issue and doesn't resolve it in a particular um, in a particular manner. Um, also, uh, our, our instructions were to attempt to distinguish between or, or attempt to explain the monetary relief that was entered here. Um, because in trademark cases, you typically have a sharp distinction between the, the legal remedy of an award of the plaintiff's actual damages, where you do have a, a very strict causation requirement on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the equitable remedy of an accounting of the defendant's profits in which the, the methodology is somewhat different and there, there are different goals. And one of them is deterrence, which is something different from making the plaintiff whole. And so we hope to make that point as well. Um, and then uh, because of the, you know, what, what really is the split in the circuits here involving the proper test to be applied for extraterritoriality, um, we were charged with making the case for one of the many tests that are out there and that are described, I think, very well by the Court of Appeals in this case, which, of course, came up with an additional test. Um, and our instructions were to advocate adoption of the Vanity Fair test. Uh, originating in the Second Circuit, which you, you can't say it's the majority rule out there. You might be able to say it's the plurality rule out there. But in any case, um, it, uh, we, we certainly didn't advocate that simply because it was the most commonly applied. And a lot of the other tests look a lot like Vanity Fair. There's not a whole lot of difference between them. Um, but we, we did think citizenship was important, but not dispositive. Um, and that, that was one of the reasons, again, we were charged with coming down on the side of Vanity Fair. Our ultimate position was that um, the presumption of extraterritoriality has been rebutted by the Lanham Act, but at the same time, we did not take a position on the, the merits of the ultimate question as to whether extraterritoriality was appropriate in this particular case. And, and therefore, our brief was, was filed in support of neither party. Okay, thank you very much for all of that. Um, so I, I want to uh, circle back, and I said I, I would love to um, figure out where the points of agreement are and, and drill down on the points of disagreement. Um, so uh, I'm trying to keep score here. Um, and on the modern framework, step one, um, which is to determine whether the presumption against extraterritorial reach has been rebutted, um, uh, Tim and um, Lucas say it has not been rebutted, um, and Ted and Matthew um, say it has. Tim and, and Lucas, I might add, uh, are joined by the Solicitor General. So that, that's one point uh, on disagreement about whether that's been rebutted in the Lanham Act. Um, there is the question, of course, about whether that is something the court needs to address um, because they could bypass it and go to step two, um, as was done in the most recent 
um, uh, case, the, the patent case, um, the Western Jekko Gecko, Gecko uh, <laughs> case. Um, then um, there's a, uh, I, I would say there's a disagreement about a couple of other disagreements. There's a disagreement about um, citizenship where you left off, Ted, right? Um, so um, the the two amicus authors here disagree on the importance of citizenship and the two parties disagree <laughs> on the importance of citizenship. And um, the Solicitor General does not think that citizenship should be important. Um, and then I would say there's a little bit of disagreement, um, maybe not so much um, about the focus of the Lanham Act. Um, so for, for step two, um, um, uh, Lucas, the, the petitioner argued to, that the focus is use in commerce. Um, and the Solicitor General said the focus is consumer confusion. Um, and Matthew, you said, well, it's consumer confusion, but the flip side of that coin is also the goodwill of trademark owners. Um, and um, Tim, you said confusion. And would you agree confusion or are you confusion and uh, goodwill? Well, it, it... Um, you know, Lena has several statutory causes of action, and um, two of them are likelihood of confusion based. Um, I don't believe dilution is is in play in this particular case, but there is another one which is in Section forty three C, which is very much or are much more oriented towards the protection of uh, brand owners' goodwill than the historically older causes of action and the only two that were in play when uh, when steel was decided. Um, so I think you can make the case that that both both are in play, but um, both concepts are in play, even if you're only talking about likelihood of confusion, mm -hmm. because I think there is a it's the focus should be on consumers. But at the same time, I think a component of that is the brand owner's interest as well. OK, um, so that I think that's the extent of my tallying up of, <laughs> of differences. Um, one of the, I'd say, predominant questions um, from the court um, for all of, um, for, for both of you and for the Solicitor General was about limits. You know, what, what limits are there? And of course, one of the questions from the modern framework is, you know, is this within the limits? Um, so I would like to just invite you to talk about any of those points of disagreement that I observed, um, or if you wanted to weigh in on what you think the, the limits are um, to any of the tests that have been proposed. Yeah, you, you want to start, uh, Lucas? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I think one thing that really came through when talking about what the focus of the test is to figure out what has to happen in the United States for this to be a domestic application of the law is really how do you administer that? How do you figure out what counts as happening in the United States? What are the limits of that? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, we think that our, our approach, you know, where was the mark used provides a clear administrable test, you know, where was the good used? Where was this advertisement made? Um, and I think once you get beyond that, that kind of concrete objective act that's happening, uh, you get into a lot of fuzziness. And um, I, think the, I think the court was struggling to, to understand what the limiting principles were um, with the question is, well, where, was there confusion within the United States? And one of the examples that came up is, uh, imagine you have a trade show in Germany but you've got people from the United States who attend those trade shows. They might be prospective customers. Um, if they get confused in Germany and they come back home, does that become domestic confusion? I think Matt would say that it does. I think the Solicitor General office seemed to suggest that it, it, it might. Um, but then you have the situation where a German trade show ends up being governed by US law. When you've got a US customer who walks by, Chinese law, when a Chinese customer walks by, and Swiss law, when a Swiss customer walks by. And in terms of having sort of those clear rules that the court really likes to apply in sensitive areas like extending US law to govern transactions and conduct in foreign countries, um, you know, I think, I think that that reaches to, a, you know, creates a lot of line drawing problems and difficulties in finding the limits. Um, I think if we're going to the, the goodwill, uh, of the uh, of the mark owner, you have the same problem because I think Matt would say, well, if it's a U.S. company, anything that's happening to them overseas is ultimately felt in the United States. 
So if it's a U.S. plaintiff, then anything in the world is kind of fair game um, on their view. And, you know, yeah, I, I suppose that's an administrable rule. Anything goes, but uh, it certainly has some, uh, uh, the consequences of that are pretty stark. Uh, give, give you more airtime um, on, on some of the other disagreements. So um, could you say why you think um, the presumption has not been rebutted in the Lanham Act? And 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 you made an argument today about why there is some logic to focusing on citizenship, but that you know there were certainly other opinions that were yeah based on that. yeah. And in, in in terms of why it doesn't rebut the presumption, it's it's pretty straightforward because uh, under the current doctrine, if a in order to rebut the presumption, it has to be you know clear and unmistakable, which usually means it has to expressly say that it applies outside of the United States. And there are lots of statutes that say this applies extraterritorially. This applies to conduct happening outside the United States, or more commonly, this applies to conduct outside the United States if this is satisfied and this is satisfied and this is satisfied. So Congress is actually putting these limits on there because it's a pretty big deal to be reaching into other countries' territories. Um, in terms of the U.S. citizenship, so Steele thought that was very important because the presumption against extraterritoriality has historically been treated a lot differently when you have a U.S. citizen involved. So the, you know, going back to the 1800s, the rule was a country cannot apply its laws outside of its own territory. It was very, very strict. But there was always an exception that says, well, you can do it for your own citizens. You can govern what they're doing, no matter where you they are in the world. And so I think it was drawing from that really deeply rooted idea that Congress has this extraordinary power over U.S. citizens, even when they're acting outside of the United States. It referred to, I think, three different times in Steel the Court, uh, made reference to that principle in cases that were applying it. And so Steele thought it was very important that the U.S. citizen was involved. And then um, I think you can't just take that away. It might be that under the modern presumption that U.S. citizenship is not as important. U.S. defendants get the same benefit of the presumption as foreign defendants do under the modern framework. But if you're trying to mesh the modern framework with what steel is doing. I don't think you can just take out that one piece of it. You can't just start dismantling parts of steel and ignoring everything else that was putting it together. I think if you're going to say, well, we don't care about U.S. defendants or, you know, U.S. versus foreign defendants anymore, then I think you really need to just reevaluate the, the whole frame, the, the, the whole question under the modern framework. I think under that, it, it pretty clearly doesn't overcome the presumption. Thank you. Sure. I mean, it really is interesting to see how these issues come together. I mean, I, uh, we, I think we've got some law students here. You know, you're talking about rules versus standards and what's clear and what's, you know, arguably less clear. Uh, I suppose uh, uh, using the use as a um, the focus of the statute, we can assume it offers some clarity, but it also leaves open a ton of problematic behavior, right? Even the kinds of things that Steele was talking about, where let's say someone dumps a bunch of you know fake Rolex watches in Mexico, and there's no U.S. consumer there who sees it, but the watches all come back over to the United States and cause a problem for the the watch company. I think my I think Lucas would say that's not the forger's problem; that's whoever brought it over's problem, but that's why U.S. consumer confusion um, uh, may be an appropriate uh, 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 question or focus for the act. And then, you know, and, and same with uh, a trademark goodwill. It's um, if let's say that you, your your mark is 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 used in Germany and it's used on construction equipment, and that construction equipment fails and uh, uh, you know, people die as a result. But it turns out that it was your competitors infringing a device that had the um, that that failed, but you're the one who's blamed for it. Your goodwill is felt you know lost in America. Your mark has become less valuable, even if what happened uh, and even if the infringement itself happened in Germany. So you know these are hard questions. and I, I think it'll be interesting to see what the court does to the extent it reaches those points because they weren't necessarily, fully developed in the lower court's opinions. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't know how it'll be, it'll just be interesting to see if they get to those questions, you know, how much loss they put on that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then as for the presumption itself and the citizen and the effect of the citizenship, I guess I'm repeating a little bit of what I was saying before, 
I think that the question of citizenship was discussed in Steele, but it's pretty, and I think I heard Lucas, maybe this is what you were saying. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. It's a little hard to read Steele as saying the way extraterritoriality works is if it's a U.S. defendant, um, the laws are always extraterritorial. That's probably not a, an accurate reading of what Steele was trying to get at. And so to say that's what all Steele was limited to leaves you in sort of a, an odd place. You're maybe not reading. Yeah, I would think the court would want to give its past decisions um, a sensible reading. Uh, and that one would be a little hard to, to make stick if that's all that was going on. And so, you know, I, again, I, you could hear that in the questions today. At least I thought I could. People, what should we do with Steele? Do we need to overrule it? Can we say it has no continuing vitality? Should we keep it? Um, should we keep part of it and not all of it? Uh, so you could see them struggling with that, I thought, um, uh, pretty clearly from the questions. Great. Uh, okay. You want to jump in, Tim? Sure. I, I think um, some of the questions, some of the limits, you know, I wish they had gone into some of the circuit tests a little bit more, right? Because mm -hmm. McBee, which I'm pretty, is that first her circuit. circuit actually says that, right? That if it's a U.S. citizen, we really don't care about anything else, which really creates challenges under our treaty obligations about the way we treat domestic IP rights owners and foreign IP rights owners, use treaty violation to do that. Uh, and so I don't, I think citizenship is actually should be irrelevant. And so, you know, the court was really struggling. Are you asking us to overrule steel or not? And I'm like, I hope we do. Like, it just seems utterly inconsistent with everything we're doing now. So I, I'm an academic. I can get away with saying that. Um, I do think that um, thinking, so talking about like, right, all these impacts overseas, it could impact domestic goodwill. Yes, but that doesn't mean the Lanham Act is the corrective measure. Right, you're not guaranteed that every harm you've ever encountered necessarily gets to be remedied by any court, let alone a US court. So the question then becomes, is that what the Lanham Act is supposed to be and how is that measurable? Which is why I think we do use likelihood of confusion, right? Trademark law is weird that it's protecting both consumers and producers while also trying to protect competition too, right? So it's sort of this triad. Um, but that's why we tend to use likelihood of confusion with some exceptions, statutory exceptions, as sort of the proxy for goodwill. And likelihood of confusion is something that is more readily measurable in a geographic sense uh, than something like the goodwill of a company. Now, can there be ambiguity? Can there be concerns with the trade show? Yes, uh, but those rare exceptions doesn't seem to be the reason to say throw everything out. Uh, the court, another limit that the court surprisingly started to take on is the role of proximate cause in some of these analyses, right? And if you look back again at the Western JECO case, Chico, um, there's actually some conversation about proximate cause, both in the briefing and there's a footnote where they drop, where they say, oh, don't forget proximate causes out there. Uh, I It wasn't briefed up in this case, but I, that was one of the surprises for me at oral argument is that they are struggling with limits on some of the scope, these scope issues and proximate cause seems to be one, a lever that is at least in their mind and one that I think is underdeveloped and underutilized, uh, more so particularly in the patent space where it's just sort of like, eh, if there's infringement, you kind of get everything that comes down the pipe. Uh, and I think that's a bad perspective on proximate cause, but that is another limit that's out there that they gestured to today. I don't think that they're gonna grab onto it necessarily, but that caught me by surprise in today's argument. Great. Thanks, Tim. So in, in contrast to the, the patent side, uh, on the trademark side, which is all I do, uh, we, we don't often get into the rules versus standards debate um, because the, the opportunities just don't present themselves as often. Um, but you know, here I think the, the, only, the only readily apparent bright line rule the court might adopt is that uh, uh, the presumption uh, against extraterritoriality means something more than it did in the 1950s and therefore um, the Lanham Act doesn't pre, uh, doesn't rebut it, and so that's now that may be the end of the analysis. Otherwise, the courts really has to mix it up on some some old fashioned standards, which this this particular court may be, you know, inclined to do versus adopting bright line rules. Um, generally, it seems to be where this particular court is headed in, in a lot of areas, especially on the patent side, but in other areas of the law as well. Um, with respect to citizenship, uh, I agree personally. I don't. I don't know that it is terribly relevant. Um, but if you've got steel to deal with, uh, it seems to have been important in steel, uh, and that's one of the reasons why our brief 
uh, acknowledged it. Um, and then um, I have been surprised, somewhat surprised at the, the, the lack of frequency with which uh, Lexmark has come up. Um, I think I only counted one time that it, that it came up in, in oral argument. I would, I would not be surprised to have the court seize upon some aspect of Lexmark and proximate cause and the standing inquiry um, to resolve this however it does. And it certainly is true on the trademark side. Lexmark articulated um, a test for standing and false advertising actions. <clears throat> it is increasingly taking over as the test for standing in all Lanham Act uh, litigation. It's not quite there yet, um, but again, I can see the court looking to its own authority, which the court, of course, is inclined to do, and you know, seizing upon some aspect is, is their proximate causation from these sales only between European entities um, and the damage claimed by the, the plaintiff, plaintiff in this action. So Lexmark asks about the zone of interest, which just seems to get us right back in the same place. It, so it, I'm not it, sure how much it, it helps. Well, I'm not sure how much it helps. I mean, it's it's more of a uh, you know it's more of a standard than a bright line rule. And Lexmark, of course, rejected the categorical rule that only competitors could have standing to to prosecute false advertising actions. Um, but but yes, it's it's but it's an alternative. It's perhaps an alternative framework, an alternative standard when compared to Vanity Fair, McBee, and, and then everything else that's out there. Right. All right. Well, I would like um, each of you to have an opportunity to um, reflect on the argument today. If anything, anything was asked or said that you found interesting um, and uh, whether you have any predictions with regard to what the court might do or any, the way any particular justice seems to be leaning. Do you want to start, Lucas? The the only prediction I will make is that they will issue a decision sometime between now and early July, <laughs> and that they will probably hold that this is they will probably not hold that this is a question of subject matter jurisdiction. <laughs> they might say nothing about that. Um, I, I'll be honest, this was my first argument before the court, and so I think a lot of it was just kind of a personal thing more than, um, you know, for for the experience, um, even more so than the the substance of the case. And given that I've been up since 5.30, which is about 12 hours ago, uh, and all the adrenaline is mostly worn off, I don't remember a whole lot about what happened during it. So, um, oh, okay. Uh, very interested to hear them. I, I will say one thing that had nothing to do with any of the questions is just how close the justices are to the council. Um, you're, it's, it's probably six or seven feet away from the chief justice and you cannot see them all at once. Um, so it's a, it's a very intimate uh, setting, and it really does lend itself to being a very conversational tone. So any of you who are able to see or listen to the argument, I think it really was for all of the advocates, a really conversational tone between them and the, and the justices. And so I, it's not very deep, but that's, I think that's, that's what right. I had to say. And congrats on your first argument. Wow, that Thank was you. really terrific. Well done. <laughs> I completely agree with Lucas's predictions. I think he's nailed them. <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't add anything uh, prediction wise either. Uh, I'll just say, um, again, experientially, you know, the, the last argument I did was uh, in the COVID period where they were letting advocates in the courtroom, but just the advocate and just the court. Uh, the one I use, it's sort of like being in a shopping mall in the middle of the night. You know, you're at a place where there's supposed to be a lot of people and no one is there. That's sort of a, 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 just a very solemn, empty feel to it. Uh, still probably better than doing it by phone, but this was much closer to the real thing with, it was the courtrooms to me seemed to be pretty well packed. And, uh, there's there's sort of an extra you know buzz to the whole proceedings as as a result of that, uh, and then as for the argument itself, I mean I too I, I think the transcript is up. I haven't gone back really to look at it yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to be told what was said at the argument because I really don't remember very much of it myself either. Um, you know I I was struck by uh, steel seemed to be on everyone's minds and no one no one seemed to know quite what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our suggestion was leave it to the people across the street in Congress. Uh, 
and that that suggestion with everything from flat out overruling it to doing something in between seemed to really dominate the conversation in a way that I don't normally see in a Supreme Court argument, you know, to be that open about what well, should we overrule this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that was interesting. And what they'll do with it, uh, we'll know probably by July 4th, give or take. Um, Great. Thanks. Tim? Uh, I was surprised about the conversation about overruling uh, since, again, nothing is really briefed up as a stare decisis issue either, right? So has there been a substantial change by their own law, right? So uh, I'll be curious if they try and find a way, I forget the language that was used, to basically reconcile it. I think that that's what the Solicitor General was trying to give them that path. Uh, I do think that they will. I don't think they're going to say, oh, trademark is completely different than RJR Nabisco and for everything else, it's a two-step framework, but the Lanham Act is different because of steel. I don't see that happening at all, particularly given the fracture across the circuit courts about the different ways they've interpreted steel. Uh, so I do think you'll see some sort of reconciliation between RJR and steel, whether they jettison or just say we don't have to answer the citizenship question, I don't know. Um, whether they go with step two or say it's rebutted because of steel, I don't know. I, I'm more confident. I felt like there felt some resonance with the Solicitor General's view that this really does feel, steel feels like step two focus analysis in a way, uh, even if that's not what we were talking about back uh, in the day. Uh, otherwise, if they say the presumption is rebutted, then maybe it's step one and a half, right? That fits into that space. Um, but I think that will be interesting in terms of outcome. They were really taken with the European Union's brief. So, the, the, so from my perspective, right, my interest in conflicts and comedy uh, is floating out there. Do I think they're going to embrace what I would love to see them do? No. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's going to happen. But I do think that concern with the interference with a foreign sovereign and the laws of another country will be part of the conversation in some way, whether it's justifying the presumption presumptions not rebutted because of that concern uh, or whether they actually do embrace some conversation about that factor in uh, steel, I don't know, but they were really taken by the the European Union's uh, brief uh, in a way that we talked beforehand. That I don't I don't think it does the work that they think it does. Uh, for me, there's a very distinct difference between how you acquire trademark rights in a domestic market versus the rights that you get in enforcing that trademark in foreign markets, uh, and I think that's a divide that. Is, was not properly reflected in that brief. So, but the court was taken with it. Uh, and so they, they, I've seen them confuse some of that dynamic before, like in the exhaustion context, where they talk about certain things like exhaustion being extraterritorial. I'm like, not really, because we're actually limiting US rights. We're not applying US rights in foreign countries. So the court, the territoriality principle has different dimensions. One is, yes, US rights are US rights, or you're right. Uh, but how you enforce those rights is different. And so that brief didn't do as much work. Ted? Um, so with respect to the, the shopping mall in the middle of the night, uh, I can confirm for on behalf of those of us in the cheap seats um, uh, earlier today uh, that the, the courtroom was in fact uh, pretty crowded. And so for those of you who've never been to an argument, uh, the seats are very, very narrow. There are no armrests. And so you, you tend to get to know your immediate neighbors fairly well in the hour that you're sitting there before argument starts. Um, I, I don't have any predictions the outcome as well. I think there's too much going on and too many questions coming from different justices on different subjects. I think steel has to be addressed somehow. Um, and either it's, it's still viable, and if it is, it means that the presumption against extraterritoriality has been rebutted or the court is going to have to go, you know, the court's either going to find it's consistent with its more modern case law or it's not. Um, and I think that's a threshold question that, that it's got to address. Um, and from that, all sorts of things will, are, are going to flow. Great. Um, so I would like to ask if the audience has, oh, there, there's a question, question, but, but he, <laughs> but he'll go last. Um, I would like to ask if the audience has any questions. Um, Josh. So the background of extraterritoriality, I think the court has in its mind the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and other types of statutes. And I'm just where citizenship does matter. So I'm wondering if you can get any sense of how the court conceptualized 
the difference in harm to foreign people from U.S. actors, U.S. actors from foreign in the context of U.S. citizens having rights. Okay, let me just repeat for the online audience. Um, so the question was essentially um, extraterritoriality might might mean different things for different statutes. In some, it might really matter whether um, whether the 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 defendant is a U.S. citizen or not. And it sounds like from your question, you think maybe not maybe not so much in the Lanham Act. And the, the question is the kinds of Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Take a shot to me, that is all subsumed in the focus analysis, right? You have to look to the statute to see what harms is the, is the statute trying to address. And, and what I think gets lost sometimes is focus is actually fairly fact intensive, right? Because it's got to be relative to the facts of the case. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, is the, 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 the focus of the statute about U.S. citizen harm? Is it about some other harm? And to me, that gets subsumed in the focus analysis. Justice Kagan alluded today to how flexible and maybe negatively flexible the focus analysis is. But I think I that's positively. where you, I, 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 possibly positively. It was, it, it was hard to gauge sometimes. Um, I think positively. Uh, but I think that's where the analysis comes out because you've got to look to the statute and say, what harms are we worried about? And there the citizenship could become relevant. But that language does not exist in the Lanham Act. Um, it's really about, you know, again, debating over what the focus is, but nothing in the Lanham Act speaks to citizenship other than steel. Uh, yes. Thanks so much for fantastic um, uh, briefing. It's really interesting to hear all your views. I'm, I'm just fascinated about the, from an EU law perspective, why the European Commission is putting this brief before this US Supreme Court and why on earth the US Supreme Court might be remotely interested in it because the last time, as far as I understand it, the European Commission did an amicus before the US Supreme Court was in the death penalty, you know, trying to advocate that US law is wrong, EU values are such that the EU should, they should try to, to convince the US, whatever. So what, can you give a bit more of a broader framing, do you think, of, of what is at play as to, to what is the role of bar and law in, in advocating this position. I'm very curious to hear what, what, what you said about the interest of the EU's position. Thank you so much. Anyone? Wayne on that one. So uh, I, I think there's a really big difference in how the court looks at um, foreign countries or transnational organizations like the, the EU's views on things like uh, cruel and unusual punishment, sort of the, the moral values things that are governed by our domestic constitution, and a very different view when it comes to things that are governed by treaties and um, transnational agreements. So there are a number of treaties that govern trademarks. There's a Paris Convention, which is from 1883, and there's 179 signatories to it. So this is an area where um, many countries and the European Union have always, you know, ha have kind of a, a real stake in the game because the United States is a member to these trees along with the rest of them. And in that context, the court really does care about, well, how have the other members of this tree union interpreted it? How does they view, you know, how do they view how this um, regime should work? And when we're talking about extraterritoriality, that's when we're taking US law and we're applying it to something that's happening in a foreign country. And so the courts don't really want to get in the situation where they are creating conflicts and friction with foreign countries, because that's really something for the political branches. That's something for Congress and the executive kind of calibrate, figure out um, how far US law should go. And so if you have the European Union coming in and saying, this is a really big problem, uh, that's something the court is gonna listen to. Um, and in a number of its prior extraterritoriality cases, um, amicus briefs filed by foreign governments saying, here are the problems with extending this abroad uh, have gotten quite a lot of play from the court. Anyone else? Mike? I get my turn. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Lucas and Matt, I'm so sorry you were not treated to a Justice Breyer hypothetical. <laughs> but, um, but, but they I got teach... a Katanji Brown Jackson <laughs> hypothetical, a three-part uh, hypothetical. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, I, I teach among the things I teach is cyber law, and I'm a little worried. For, I, I wasn't familiar with this case uh, before, and I'm a little worried that about this case as the vehicle because these trademarks are in a specialized market. Uh, and so I kind of want to ask, um, what about the internet? So if you're going to do a use-based test, uh, you know. The, the internet is always in tension with the territorial presumption across all domain areas of law. 
And uh, it seems to me like a focus on consumer confusion in a world where Amazon customers are being presented with goods being produced and sold from countries all around the world would you know, argue in favor of broad extraterritorial reach. At the same time, the comedy uh, uh, you know, consequences of that broad reading would push in exactly the different direction. So did anyone even notice that and give you a hypo? And if they didn't, so should the they? The Chief have? Justice not only gave a hypo like that, but mentioned the word influencer very tentatively. Right. <laughs> so right. so could give us more in what context, because that seems it, it seems quite troubling to me if they don't have the internet in mind, what whatever they decide in this case. You know, I, I think the internet, I'll, I'll be happy to start. I think the internet, is in mind, in part because the chief asked about it, in part because the facts of this case involve the um, solicitation of American consumers over the internet uh, for these infringing goods. I, I don't think it's necessarily, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think our position would be if you're using the mark, uh, offering things for sale uh, in a way that is like let's say on the government's test, is likely to confuse American consumers. That's a use that's infringing. And it doesn't really matter if you're sending them mailers or you're doing it on the internet. You know, with geo uh, limiting things, it's be pretty easy not to reach American consumers if that's going to be a trademark violation. Uh, so I think that's actually relatively straightforward. You know, for the comedy questions, on the other hand, the the typical fact pattern in these cases is one that the infringing entity doesn't have any rights under any particular foreign law. They're just out there infringing. Yeah, you know, what I can say has been the practice over the 70 years that we've had steel and extraterritorial application is that where a defendant does actually have valid registration in the country where it's acting, there's never been a Lanham Act claim that's been successful against uh, one, one of those entities. Those are the claims that are that don't where the Lanham Act isn't applied extraterritorially, or the court says it could, but comedy cuts in the way. So, you know, from our perspective, that system, the internet, is a brave new world. But actually, the things have been working in a way that I think make the the principles pretty straightforward from our perspective on that. And I think that's where the Solicitor General said comedy will take care of all of that. And right. Then, uh, <laughs> And then there was some follow-up. There was some follow-up, follow yeah, just how, right. <laughs> when, and there was, there was a question, maybe it was Justice Alito, I think did talk about the internet and that's where some of the language of what counts as an infringing use came into play a little bit. Yeah, um, I talked about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what to me is more, maybe more important, but not addressed given the facts of the case are services, right? So all of Justice Brown's hypotheticals were about, you know, is it imported or not? Or is there good sold? And like the trademarks apply to services too, and that gets murkier on the internet. And so I don't think that dynamic, again, not the facts of the case, but necessarily is got some significant implications if we're talking about the internet or just sort of the way that we utilize services and the trademark service marks technically in that space. That's a, a different valence as well, which I don't think got much uh, attention again. Yeah. Just because the facts of the case are different, they're but about goods. It's tough in an hour, or even an hour and ten minutes, whatever we got. To go <laughs> so deep on all those. Issues. When there are so many tears, just trying to reconcile steel, right yes. alone, because there's so many factors. Yeah, that, that's why it's a it's a hard case. No vehicle is going to be perfect, uh, and so that's why I, when I'm trying to predict what's going to happen, they're going to try and keep it as simple as possible and punt. I think as much as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. Um, and because they only had an hour and 10 minutes, I, I commend the recording of this session to the uh, justices clerks um, <laughs> so that they can get another hour. Um, and I, I just am so grateful to all of you um, for coming tonight and for sharing these insights on the case. And thanks to the audience. Um, and we will um, thank our panelists and then adjourn to the reception. Thank you so much.